Hey YouTube, welcome back to another video and thanks for joining me. So as you might have guessed from the intro, today we're going to be looking at my Cuban Nightingale Castro and I'm going to go through how to care for a Cuban Nightingale in general. So we're going to take a look at Castro, how she's getting on and we'll take a look at her enclosure. But I think before we start, as everybody's locked in and probably a bit bored and get a bit cheesed off, the other day I put a post on my Facebook page for a free unisex t-shirt prize giveaway. So if you're interested in winning a t-shirt from my store, then I'll leave the link for my Facebook post in the description. So if you go and check that out, make sure you read through the post, have a look at the rules and how to enter. And I wish you good luck and hope you win. But I think that's enough of me waffling on. Let's crack on with today's video. So welcome back. So like I said, this is my Cuban Night and Old Castro. She's currently housed in a 3x3 wooden terrarium. And I'll go through that a little bit more in detail later on in the video. So I've had Castro for just coming up to a year now. Um, we bought her back in May last year, I believe. But she's still in her growing phase at the moment. She's only just over a year and a half old. I bought her from when she was a little baby. So just to give you a bit of a background on these animals. So as you might have guessed from their name, they originate from Cuba. Now they have been found in certain parts of America. I know when I was in Florida last year, this time last year actually, um, I've seen a lot of them around um, as well as other types of anoles. So I think they've been released and they probably thrive in their environment. So I actually got Castro from my local reptile store, which is Reptiles Cymru. I'll leave the link in the description for their details as well if you're in the Cardiff area. Now they had the parents brought into them, which were rehomed I believe because the owners couldn't look after them or didn't know what they were doing. And I know they had a clutch of eggs from this pair. Now, when I went into the store the other day, you might have seen if you follow me on Instagram that I've seen the parents, and I'll check the little video up now so you can see. Now, these lizards live to roughly around five to eight years. Obviously, in captivity, that can be changed with good husbandry and making sure you're on top of your maintenance. So I know a lot of you, when you think of anoles, you'll think of quite a small species of lizard. Now, this is the biggest species of anole, and they grow roughly between 10 to 16 inches. So Castro's still got a long way to go yet and she'll probably be roughly the size or probably a comparison maybe sort of birth the panther comedian sort of size but she's still got a long way to go yet. But since I've had her we've been working with her for quite a while and we're, that's still ongoing at the moment. She's not the sort of animal I can handle quite yet but we're still working with her to build up trust. So like I mentioned at the beginning she's housed in a 3 by 3 by one and a half foot deep wooden viv exotic medium arboreal terrarium. Managed to get there in the end. Now I know a lot of you have messaged me or left me a comment asking where I get this sort of arboreal terrarium vivarium from. Now unfortunately a lot of you have asked it from the States and I don't believe they distribute them in the States. I've tried to have a look if this is something similar but unfortunately there doesn't appear to be anything that's quite like that. But I'm sure there are equivalents in the States sort of vivarium slash terrarium. But and if I do find anything similar in the States I will add links in the description for you. Now Cuban and night anoles are quite a high heat species. Now they need a basking spot anywhere between 80 and 86 degrees Fahrenheit. Like many reptiles, they will need a temperature gradient. So what I mean by that is they will need a hot spot and then it gradually cool down throughout the bottom or throughout the terrarium. Now this gives them a heat gradient so they can choose if they're too hot, too cold, and it just makes it that much easier for them to thermoregulate. And that's a really important part of keeping them healthy. Now the way that I heat this terrarium, so in the daytime it has a basking bulb on there which gives them a basking spot of 86 degrees and I think the temperature goes down to about 75 in the day towards the bottom of the terrarium. So it's really important for Cuban and anoles to have a high temperature. If they're kept at the cooler end of the spectrum then sometimes you can have problems in digesting their food and sometimes it does affect their immune system which can cause you no end of problems. So I definitely recommend sticking it towards the higher end. Now Castro is currently at 85 degrees and that seems to be keeping her where she needs to be and she seems happy and I see her going up and down the terrarium and she's obviously thermoregulating which is great. Now she's digesting her food and she's eating and drinking like she needs to be and obviously that's a really good sign. Now in the night time you can let the temperature drop down to 70 degrees. Um, as you can imagine in the wild in Cuba, Florida it does obviously get a lot colder at night and you can do that. Now, my room usually keeps it around that temperature anyway, but I do have a reptile radiator in the terrarium. Now that is set on a thermostat and obviously that kicks in if the temperature drops below 70 degrees in the night. And obviously it doesn't create any light and it just keeps it where she needs to be. 
In terms of lighting, you're gonna need UVB. So there's a lot of lizards and reptiles need and would need UVB. An important part of this is also giving them vitamin D and helps them digest and keeps them healthy. Some of the more common problems with Cuban nitinols are things like metabolic bone disease, and they can get immune system problems, respiratory, respiratory infections, and usually these are caused from some sort of lack in your husbandry. Now if you invest in a good quality UVB light, I would always recommend Arcadia T5 systems for UVB. I've never had any problems with them in the past, they seem to last a lot longer. Now I'd always recommend you look at the manufacturer's recommendation for when you need to replace the UVB. But with me, I usually replace them every 9 to 12 months, just to be on the safe side. Now you can get a UVB reader, which tells you how long or how much UVB the bulbs are given off. They are quite expensive, but it's something we might invest in the future and might make sure that we get extra life out of our bulbs as you say, some costs with no risks to the animals. Now in terms of water, humidity, um, in the wild they do live in a humid environment in sort of forests and woodlands. Now you would need to replicate that in captivity. I'd always recommend roughly about 80% humidity for them. So when you are spraying them, whether you're spraying them manually or with a misting system, you always want to make sure that the enclosure has time to dry out slightly. Not completely dry out like a desert, but it's not always constantly wet in there. That can cause stagnant air and again respiratory infections. Just make sure that you're conscious of ventilation. I've got extra ventilation in this tank and I've also reattached the USB fans which we had when my Panther Comedian Bert was housed in this enclosure. And this just stops any stagnant air and helps air circulation. But to be fair, with the extra vents in there and going into the tank probably twice a day, opening the doors allows enough air circulation anyway. Now I miss Castro down probably twice a day and I do that manually. Now I do have a Mist King system to set up on this enclosure and we've had it on here in the past in the last room but I haven't got around to setting it up yet. But I'm here enough to make sure that she has enough water so usually when I spray her in the morning it'll stay humid for quite some time and um, by the time I usually get home from work it's still a little bit wet and some droplets on the, on the plants but then I'll usually come home and do another one and sometimes I might do one before I go to bed and that seems to keep on top of her. Now they'll very rarely drink from stagnant pools of water or water bowls, similar to comedians. So it's always recommended that you spray down the enclosure and they'll usually take the water droplets off the leaves, like green tree pythons do, comedians and that sort of thing. So just be mindful if you are putting a water bowl in there, they are missing down the tank, so they have the opportunity to drink from both. Now in terms of decoration in the enclosure, now I've done an expanding foam background, which I always prefer. I think it gives them a lot more room to climb. It just gives them a better footprint in the enclosure. So the more climbing space they've got, the bigger the enclosure technically is. I've used things like liana branches, uh, cork bark branches, cork bark, just anything you can find just to give that naturalistic look. And there are plenty of branches going along as well. And I am considering taking some of the older branches out and trying to redo this tank a little bit with to make it look a little bit nicer. Now I keep live plants in this enclosure just because it helps with humidity and it also helps promote a better biological environment for them. Now I'm a big believer in bioactive setups and trying to replicate what they would li live in in the wild as best as you possibly can. Now if you want to know how I made this terrarium I'll leave the link in the description as well as the first video I ever put on this channel. So if you want to go and check out how this was made then please check out that in the description. Now in terms of maintenance on this terrarium, because it's a bioactive setup, so it has plants, um, substrate, and there's things to keep it clean, so we've got springtails and wood lice in there, and they take care of a lot of the mess. The only thing I have to do from time to time is clean off some poop or some mess from some of the leaves, which the springtails don't get to. I wipe down the glass once a week, and that's pretty much it. And now and again I'll do a little bit of planting or trim back some of the plants, but that's as easy as it gets. Um, in the night it probably takes me roughly five minutes to take care of her, if that. Obviously if you're choosing a more sterile environment with fake plants, you would need to obviously clean up a lot more and that's why I'd always recommend a bioactive setup. It just makes that life much easier. And I do believe it enriches the animals' lives and they do get a lot more enjoyment and pleasure from that sort of setup. But I'm not gonna get into that debate, it's a massive debate. If you wanna look into more why people argue so much about this, then just go and check out any Facebook group. So generally our diet is, consists mainly of crickets, that's generally the staple of our diet, so brown crickets, black crickets, and I dust those with calcium every other day. Now she also does get small locusts and small dubu roaches from time to time, but not very often. I also provide her with fruit probably two to three times a week. Now she goes through blueberries, strawberries, 
blackberries, grapes. She tends to like a lot of different fruits and she tends to stuff herself when I put, the, put some in there for her. Now I also add some calcium powder to the fruit as well. And that just to make sure that she's getting enough calcium and obviously she's got the UVB to take care of that. And hopefully that should prevent any metabolic bone disease. Now, if you're looking for an animal to handle, now they, I'm not saying you can't handle these, but they're not generally one of those species you as a go-to for a playing with animal, like a be a dragon or a corn snake, anything like that. Now, I'm currently working with Castro at the moment, so I haven't handled her since I bought her. Obviously, I took her out when we out from the pet shop and when we put her into the enclosure. Um, but I've just been working with her slowly, and what I mean by that is just working in a terrarium every day, just getting my hands closer to her. Obviously the sprayer goes in there, which she's not scared of anymore. Now, all I'm trying to do is just give her experiences with me. They don't give her any stress, don't sort of frighten her and builds up trust with her. So it is an ongoing process. It does take quite a while. It's not gonna be a case of a couple of weeks I'm gonna put my hand in the enclosure and pull her out. Maybe, maybe if I'm lucky, but it's just a case of trying to hand feed her just so she recognizes I'm food, I'm good things rather than bad. The last thing you wanna do is push this and try and rush these things and break that trust and then you've gotta start all over again. So you wanna make sure any experience she has interacting with you, and when I say that, that could even just be you putting your hand in the tank. That's a pleasurable experience for her and she learns that you're a good thing rather than a bad thing. Now a lot of people do house Cuban night and gnolls uh, together. I know you can house them in pairs and sometimes people house females together. Now this is always advised with caution because you would need another setup just in case that didn't work out. Cuban night and gnolls can fight and do tend to fight quite a lot. And they can have vicious battles as well. The, the bites they can give are really nasty. They'll grab hold of a piece of skin and do a death roll like a crocodile, which is not very nice if you're being bitten by one. I hope you found that helpful, but overall I've been really happy since I've bought this Cuban Night and All. I've never owned one in the past. It's always been something I've been interested in. I think they're really striking, and especially when their colours are out and prominent. And obviously they're massive lizard for an and all. Now if you're looking for a pet that's not so much a handling animal and something perhaps if you're a little bit more not necessarily experienced, I think as long as you read up on any animal that you can go ahead and have success with them. I think it's really important for you to understand what sort of animal you're getting so you're not disappointed. Now if you're something that you're if you're looking for more of an animal or a pet that you can look at and admire and admire their enclosure and set them up really nicely, this is a perfect animal for you. I wouldn't say it's necessarily a good first animal for a child, just because they can give you quite a nasty bite and then not necessarily a handling animal. But overall they're generally easy to care for. As long as you make sure that you provide them with the right setup initially and you keep on top of any maintenance, you keep it on top of changing UVB bulbs, then you shouldn't have any issues. But something I'd definitely recommend going to check out is Chuck Horn on YouTube. I know when I was setting up my Cuban Light and Alls setup, he was a massive help to me. He's got a channel on YouTube as well, and I'll leave the details for his channel in the description. I definitely re recommend going to check him out. He's kept Cuban Light and Alls for years. I think he's got quite a lot of them. And it's definitely a good source of information if you're looking at how to care for these animals. Now, if you've watched this video all the way to the end, then thank you very much. I really appreciate it. But what I would say is don't just watch my video. Make sure you go out and look at a wealth of knowledge and a wealth of videos, care sheets, Facebook pages, any information you can get on these animals. The more information that you can have, the better setup you're going to be for caring for one. But as always, if you're a new subscriber to this channel, thanks for joining me and hello. If you need to be a massive favor and hit that subscribe button and that notification bell so you don't miss out on any future videos. If you're a returning viewer to this channel, then thanks very much. I really appreciate it. Both of you give me that thumbs up and drop me a comment below just to show YouTube you're enjoying this sort of content and it allows me to make more videos like these in the future. But it's been good catching up with you and going through Kasha's setup and how she's getting along. And I hope you've learned a little bit from this video. But I think that's enough for me waffling on for today. As always, I'll put a compilation at the end of this video, so don't click off quite yet. And I'll see you next time.